welcome. Mike Levine is here with us. Our discussion topic today is prison overcrowding and the growing movement for criminal justice reform in the COVID era. Michael, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me. It's my pleasure. And Anne, Anne will be introducing Michael. Okay. Um, it's my honor to introduce Michael Bean um, to all of you. Uh, I've known him for many, many years um, and, and watched him take state, county, city, govern governments to the mat um, to help incarcerated persons be treated like human beings. Um, and his, his practice is centered around constitutional law in um, civil rights cases. And he's litigated um, cases about um, unlawful confinement. I have a little list here because there's so many of them. Um, unconstitutional confinement, um, which is sort of also characterized as the overcrowding case, which he took all the way to the US Supreme Court where he prevailed. Um, and also case, cases um, to take the government to task on inadequate health care, mental and dental care, unlawful discrimination against incarcerated people with mental and physical disabilities, use of force and solitary confinement, among others. Um, I think you really enjoy hearing his overview of what he's been up to for the last 28 years or whatever it's been. Um, and we'll have Q&A at the end. Um, so save your questions or pop them in the chat. Samaya is going to be moderating the um, Q&A part. And uh, so if she has those in front of her, you're also totally welcome to raise your hand and just ask it at the time, uh, whichever feels the most comfortable with you. So Michael, take it away. Thank you, Ann. The pandemic has laid bare profound systemic inequities of our society and our public healthcare system. Prisons, jails, and detention centers have experienced extraordinary high rates of infection and death. The California prison system, despite decades of litigation and ongoing federal court remedial processes, cannot provide minimally adequate health care to the incarcerated population and had no chance to protect the people who live and work in the prisons from COVID-19. California's prisons have experienced an extraordinarily high rate of infection. More than 50% of the incarcerated people in CCR prisons have tested positive. That is five times the rate of California as a whole. 218 as of today have died. That's a rate almost twice the California rate. More than 25% of CCR staff have tested positive and there've been 26 staff deaths. Several of California's prisons experienced outbreaks that were considered the largest and most dangerous outbreaks in the United States, if not the world. How did CDCR's healthcare system under a federal court receivership fare so poorly? What went wrong? Given the level of overcrowding in California's prisons and the harsh and inadequate conditions of confinement, the healthcare system simply had no chance against COVID-19. California's system of mass incarceration of people of color and people with disabilities is simply incompatible with minimally adequate health care. It is a system designed to punish and torture. We continue to incarcerate far too many people and for far too long. California's prisons remain severely overcrowded. 25% of California's prison population today is over 50 and 10% is over 60. 25% of the population are lifers, life without parole or condemned. An additional 30% are second or third strikers. 40% are people with disabilities, including 30% with serious mental illness. 
80% are people of color. Wow. California's prisons remain severely overcrowded with harsh and inhumane conditions. Double selling is common. Eating, sleeping, and going to the toilet with a stranger no more than a few feet away at all times. Dorms are crowded with double bunks and minimal personal space. Showers and toilets are inadequate. Nutrition, exercise, and sanitation are terrible. CDCR spends $3.75 per day per person for food. Think about that. Soap and toothpaste are luxuries that must be purchased at the canteen. Let me back up for a moment to provide some context. The two largest and most significant class actions that address healthcare in California's prisons are the Plata and Coleman cases. Coleman, the first statewide class action was filed in 1990 and resulted in 1995 judgment that <clears throat> um, mental health care was unconstitutional and that prison officials were deliberately indifferent to the needs of people with psychiatric disabilities. The court ordered a comprehensive remedy addressing every aspect of mental health care and the appointment of a special master. The remedial process continues today and covers all CDCR facilities. Plata followed a statewide class action alleged be, alleging deliberate indifference to serious medical needs. That case settled in 2002 with an agreement that CDCR would completely overhaul its, its medical care policies and procedures and ensure timely access to adequate care. But in 2005, Judge Felton Henderson, the federal judge overseeing the case, described medical treatment in CDCR as still horrifying and shocking. In October 2005, he placed CDCR's medical care system under the control of a receiver. The Plata remedy is a comprehensive, covering all aspects of medical care in CDCR. Dental care is covered by a separate class action that's largely resolved. We've also, we being my firm and the prison law office have, six, have several other statewide class actions protecting prisoners with disabilities, uh, the Armstrong case and the Clark case. And they're also still pending and providing ongoing supervision by the federal courts to their remedial processes. In 2006, overcrowding in California's prison reached record levels, 173,000 people in prisons designed to hold less than 90,000. Gyms filled with triple bunks. In December 2007, uh, plaintiffs counsel in Coleman and Plata filed simultaneous motions in their respective federal court, requesting the appointment of a special three judge court requiring ca California to substantially reduce the overcrowding prison population to a level where medical and mental health care could be uh, brought to constitutional standards. Uh, after extreme litigation, intensive litigation for years and another trial that we did to that three judge court, um, the court found in our favor in 2009, holding that CDCR must reduce its population to 137.5% of capacity, approximately 25% or 40,000 persons. California appealed the case to the Supreme Court, which upheld the order in a landmark Brown v. Plata case issued in May 2011. We only won by a five to four vote. Justice Kennedy wrote the majority opinion, and I'll, I'll give you one quote from that opinion. Prisoners retain the essence of human dignity inherent in all persons. Respect for that dignity animates the Eighth Amendment prohibition against cruel and unusual punishment. The basic concept underlying the Eighth Amendment is nothing, nothing less than the dignity of man. In January 2013, after several years of work on the remedy to reduce the population, California moved to terminate the three-judge court population order and the Coleman case in its entirety. Governor Jerry Brown declared that conditions were now good enough for prisoners 
as the population was down to 150% of capacity. The three judge court and the Coleman court denied the motion and the Supreme Court again affirmed this time six to three. In 2015, CDCR's population dropped below 137.5% of capacity and has remained below that ever since. Now let's come back to the pandemic. On March 25th, 2020, just weeks after Governor Newsom's emergency proclamation, about a year ago, if you remember, Plaintiffs' Counsel and Plata and Coleman filed an emergency motion for an order requiring the state to substantially reduce its prison population to a level that would give incarcerated people the ability to comply with Governor Newsom's public health directives, six feet of social distancing. So we wanted an order to go farther than 137.5, much further down. At that time, CDCR had no confirmed COVID cases. The first death occurred on April 19th. Testing had barely started. The mo motion focused on the crowded dorms, meager and shared toilets, sinks, showers, the large, aged, and medically vulnerable population, and the inadequate and dangerous conditions. We included recent photographs from prison tours showing old men with walkers, wheelchairs, and oxygen tanks crowded together in, in uh, cramped spaces. Our motion was supported by multiple expert declarations which established the cruel reality. The pandemic would devastate the prison population without prompt action. And the only plan that would save countless lives was substantial and targeted rapid population reduction. In the days and weeks after the motion was filed, Governor Newsom announced that the prisons would be closed to new admissions from county jails for 30 days. And Secretary Diaz announced accelerated releases for certain persons with less than 60 days left on their sentence. The state estimated that the population would be rapidly reduced by 6,500. On April 4th, 2020, the court denied our motion finding that it did not satisfy the procedural requirements of federal law, the Prison Litigation Reform Act. On April 8th, just four days after the three judge court order, plaintiffs in the Plata case filed a renewed emergency motion for population reduction. On April 17th, the court denied that motion, finding that CDCR was not deliberately indifferent to the pandemic, given the population reduction measures that had already been implemented and other measures such as a plan for masks, no mask got into the prisons, by the way, till late April, hand sanitizer, movement restrictions, and a plan to reduce the density of dorm housing. The judge said that CDCR's actions were quote, reasonable under the circumstances. They were doing lots of things and things that some other jurisdictions were not doing. The court also found that it did not have the power to order a release of prisoners or their transfer to a safe but secure location where they could practice social distancing. We had suggested empty army bases, uh, private prisons, and state hospitals. Unfortunately, we correctly anticipated that the incarcerated persons who would die from COVID-19 would be the aged and medically vulnerable. Of the 218 deaths, the average age is 64. 78% are people with disabilities, a far higher percentage than the percentage in the population in the prisons. 38% are people with serious mental illness. The vast majority have been previously identified as high risk for a poor outcome if, if, uh, if um, infected with COVID-19. 71% of the deaths so far are people of color, 38% Hispanic, 26% Black. 88% had been determined by CDCR to have a low risk of reoffending. The population reduction programs implemented by the governor and CDCR since March have reduced the population by more than 20,000, but they've not focused on the population most likely to be hospitalized and die from COVID-19. While the governor and secretary announced in early July that they would conduct a special review of approximately 8,000 people 
identified as the most medically vulnerable, only 51 of those people have been reduced, released to date. Our failure to obtain a population reduction order for a class in a prisoner jail due to COVID-19 has unfortunately been common where district courts have issued orders, they have been rapidly reversed by appellate courts. Even court orders addressing COVID-19 measures short of population reduction orders have been rare. Both the Coleman and Plata courts have entered orders and required extensive reporting and monitoring about the establishment of quarantine and isolation spaces, testing, masks, transportation, access to mental health care, and now vaccines. While we continue to push every day in Plata, Coleman, and Armstrong for improvements in CDCR's COVID-19 strategy and response, the failure to reduce the population to humane and appropriate levels has resulted in the very disaster we predicted. Imagine if a wildfire or a flood was about to overwhelm a prison. Would we leave incarcerated persons, medical and correctional staff in the prison so long as we gave them some rudimentary and ineffective help? The California prison system, while better than some other prison systems, has failed miserably to protect the human beings living and working inside from the pandemic. More than half of the COVID deaths for incarcerated persons and staff occurred in the last three months. By then, Masks have been provided, testing was widespread, staff testing and masking was required, movement was carefully restricted, and isolation and quarantine spaces have been set aside at each prison. But when the surge came, it overwhelmed the prisons uh, just as if we had nothing in place. Now for some good news. Along with the rest of the state, California prisons are enjoying a dramatic reduction in COVID cases since the winter surge lost steam by late January. While CDCR was experiencing 10,000 active, active COVID cases per day for weeks on end during December and multiple deaths each week, today there are only 63 active cases among incarcerated persons, 63 among 95,000, 58 in the last 14 days. <laughs> Staff cases are also reduced, but remain at, a, in my opinion, a problematic level. There are 550 active staff cases and 155 new cases in the last 14 days. The case fatality rate in CDCR is actually substanti substantially better than in the free world. While 1.5% of free Californians who have confirmed cases of COVID die, only 0.4% of incarcerated persons in California prisons who get COVID die. This probably reflects that testing, monitoring, and medical care for diagnosed COVID patients under PLATA's medical system is pretty good, including access to outside hospitals and ICUs. Vaccine distribution to staff and incarcerated persons has been quite successful so far. The focus consistent with state guidelines has been on the aged and medically vulnerable and on medical and custody staff. Acceptance of the vaccine has been over 65% for incarcerated people. As of this week, 67% of the incarcerated population has been offered at least one dose and 39% has accepted. More than 10,000 have received their second dose. More than 42% of staff have accepted at least one dose. The challenge now is completing vaccine distribution and increasing vaccine acceptance in both the incarcerated population and staff. We have helped to put together a coalition of prison reform, abolitionists, activist organizations, healthcare organizations, and legal advocacy groups, including formerly incarcerated and families of incarcerated, in an effort to improve on vaccine education and target the particular concerns of incarcerated persons and those of members of different religious, 
ethnic, ethnic and other groups that have concerns about the vaccine. We listened carefully to the fears, concerns, and lack of trust in government, the prison system, and the medical establishment that make people reluctant to accept the vaccine. Groups are framing their written audio and video content to be responsive to those issues and to provide the scientific evidence. Several articles have recently mentioned that several prisons may have reached herd immunity levels. While it's true that the sum of vaccinated persons and prisoners who have immunity from having survived a COVID infection exceeds 70% at a good number of prisons, it is a mistake to look at a prison in a pandemic as an isolated island. Prisons and jails are open to their surrounding communities and the virus travels freely through prison walls carried by staff, receipt and release of incarcerated persons, contractors and deliveries. COVID is a good lesson about why we cannot ignore our prisons and jails. The people who live and work there exist and are part of our society. We can see the light at the end of the tunnel. We can just keep on, need to keep on pushing. Um, one thing that I thought it'd be good to talk to you guys about also is what can you do um, to help? And I think there's a lot we all can do to help. Um, and I, I think we all need to become fully informed about <clears throat> the science of COVID and the science of the vaccines to read materials about them, be able to answer questions <clears throat> and to be one of the informed people rather than one of the uh, frightened or ignorant people. Uh, people's concerns are well taken about the vaccine. There's no reason to be trusting in American government, American prison system, or the American medical care system. It's done a lot of hard, they all have done a lot of horrible things, especially to the kinds of people who are incarcerated in prisons and jails and their families. Um, and, you know, we all, hopefully you know something about those horrors. And so there's reasons for people's distrust. But this is, this is not something, an, this is not an experiment on prisoners. This is not uh, a different vaccine that's being given to anyone else. <clears throat> this, the, uh, because of these cases, uh, we, are, we have much better access here in California's prisons than most other prison systems. Uh, I, I'm very sorry to say that around the country, uh, many states have not even started incarcerate, uh, vaccinating anyone, staff or, or incarcerated people in their prisons and jails. Uh, some states have just started on staff and refused to do incarcerated people. And some states are just barely getting started. Um, you know, the good news here is that we're way, way ahead on this. Um, and you know, it's, it's interesting politically that, that the governor's office has not spoken a lot about this. Um, I think they're a little frightened of the pushback and we're not complaining as long as the vaccine continues to come in at very high levels, which it does. Um, so uh, it's not a politically pop popular thing to do. Uh, you can think of, you know, people who are not getting the vaccine and waiting for it and and vulnerable on the outside. And, and uh, it's very possible if the news <laughs> got, well, got out, it's not secret, but it's not being trumpeted that you know, there'd be pushback. Uh, people don't really give a shit about people in prison or even the people who work there. Um, it's really a quite, you know, they're out of our minds and uh, people don't like to hear about it. And they certainly don't wanna waste precious vaccine on those people. Um, obviously, the public health rationale, putting aside decent, decency and humanity, but the public health rationale is that prisons and jails are the major source of outbreaks in the United States, even more than nursing homes. 
counties that have prisons and jails with big outbreaks have much higher rates of COVID than counties that don't have prisons and jails in them. The better job we do on prisons and jails, the better for all of us. Um, and again, um, there, there are lots of reasons why we should be investing even more in healthcare and prisons and certainly vaccinations for prisons. Um, there's another thing that that I think you guys might be able to do, which is, I mentioned that there's been not enough, in my opinion, releases, but there've been a lot of releases. So the, the population's gone from 120,000 at the beginning of the pandemic down to uh, 95,000 now. Uh, many of those people that have been released um, are in our communities. And there's a tremendous need to work on reentry, and and there are lots of organizations who are working on those issues. Um, this is this is <laughs> people come out with very little. Okay, the gate money, the money that they give you when you leave the prison, is the same now as it was 35 years ago. No inflation adjustment. It's two hundred dollars. Okay. Mm -hmm. And they take from that $200 money for the clothes on your back and your bus ticket. Um, they put it on a, on a uh, for-profit company's card, debit card, which also takes money out every time you use the card. It's a great deal. <laughs> so people are coming out with nothing. They have no cell phone. They have no clothes. They don't necessarily have any place to go. Um, they don't want to get on public transportation necessarily. They don't even know how to use public transportation. Some people have been in for 20, 30, 40 years that are getting out. Some of those people are at your school. There, there's a program called Project Rebound at San Francisco State um, that takes formerly incarcerated people who have uh, earned credits while they're in prison. Uh, some of them even got their AA and helps to um, support them on campus. Um, it's a, San Francisco State was one of the first programs, Project Rebound programs. There are now 20 or 30 of them around, around the state and mostly in community colleges. Um, it's very, again, there's lots of things to do. These people are around us and they need, they need support. Um, and and the, the sad fact is that the four weeks to two months, depending on the study, uh, upon people's release from incarceration has an extraordinarily high mortality rate, mm -hmm. much higher than any mortality rate while incarcerated. Mm -hmm. uh, that includes uh, suicides and drug overdoses mainly. Um, again, people who have substance abuse problems um, are not used to what's on the street right now. And they also could be uh, just having a hard time and, and turn, turn back to substance abuse again. Um, but it's, it's a dangerous time. You know, people need help connecting with, uh, to get a Cal ID, to get a cell phone, to get their benefits. They all can get Obamacare but they have, to be, they have to get help to sign up. Um, the places they used to walk into, the storefronts and agencies are, are mainly closed. And you can only access them online. But if you don't have a phone or a computer, it's tough. So anyway, I think these are, these are kinds of things that you may wanna think about um, as, as advocacy uh, avenues uh, that are available. And unless there's something else, Anne, you wanted me to say now, I just wait for questions. Um, I don't have anything to pop in right now. Um, so we can go to the Q and A. If you have a question, raise your hand. Yes, um, Michael, what would you say to somebody who doesn't think our prison system is, has anything to do with race? 
Has anything to do with race? Yes. Um, I just think they have to look at the statistics. I mean, I just, I just kind of believe on, I'm kind of a numbers person, <laughs> along with, uh, you know, talking about people, sometimes the facts just help. So for example, San Francisco, which is considered to be a rather progressive liberal community, um, if you go to their jail, you'll find that um, while I think our population is under 10 or 15% black right now, it's probably about 75% black in our jail. Now, uh -huh. how, can that, how can that be when we have a progressive mayor, a black mayor, progressive DA, um, progressive judges, all democratic elected, um, and I think that's just one of the best examples of the, um, if you want to call it unconscious, I think that's generous, but the bias in our criminal justice system, it is, it is simply not uh, appropriate. Another, another story I tell is um, Anne and I met through our children, our oldest son, we each have a son who is about to be 40, right? Is that about right? <laughs> Close. Um, so it was a lot longer, Anne, that we, we've known each other. Um, when, when they were in high school, they were going to a, to a rock concert and they were on BART and they were drinking beers and they got picked up. You know what happened to them? What? Nothing. They called, they called us on the phone and asked us to pick them up. Yes. That's a little, I, diff that's a little different that, than happens to people of color when they're picked up by, by police. And, um, you know, it's just a whole different line. Um, it's just a whole different world. Um, it, it is. And I commend you and Anne for both realizing that. And I, you, you completely answered my question. I just, it, it really bothers me when I talk about uh, the prison system and how it is a racial issue. And people like to bring up the fact that it's not because it's making them uncomfortable. But when you look at all the facts and the statistics, like you just mentioned, it, 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 I mean, there's your argument right there. I mean, that those are your facts. I mean, it is. And I, I'm, I appreciate your answer. I think it's also true that, that um, you know, people will tell you, oh, you know, the CDCR staff is very integrated. It, you know, it's led by, by lots of wardens are, are uh, Black or Hispanic and Lots of women have risen. Our new secretary is a woman. Um, all those things are true, but I just think that the fundamental, you know, racism of the system is is just it's much deeper than CDCR. It's the whole criminal justice system from start to finish. It's from the from the arrest all the way through. You know. Yes, agreed. One of the things that I would like to mention when Michael was talking about the overcrowding case and, <clears throat> and the response to COVID, CDRC, by the way, is the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I got the first two right. Um, that if you haven't been inside um, a prison, especially an old one like San, San Quentin, um, it's hard to imagine how these people are stacked on top of each other. So if somebody sneezes from the fifth tier, there's all these open bars and underneath them, there's a whole bunch of open bars and um, there's just, and they're all squished in together. They used to be in triple bunk beds in the gym, but Michael took care of that. Um, but they're really squished together. So the whole notion of social distancing is just folly in the, in, in the prison system. Um, so that when you're thinking about COVID and vaccines and um, 
access to, to health care um, and even diagnosis in the early days of all of this, um, it's good to keep that in mind that um, these people have no options. They're just sitting ducks. Um, and I think that that really informs how important um, in, in these institutions that um, access to vaccination is going well in California. Um, and it's important, um, even if you have misgivings about the vaccine or vaccines in general. Um, so I wanted to point that out. Um, and Michael, could you say just a touch more about um, the process that you went through in your own mind and then um, how you gathered information um, to address the prisoners' concerns about the vaccine in a way that they could hear sure. it, who the messenger had to be and so on? Sure. <clears throat> well, we're, I'm in touch with um, various uh, advocacy groups <clears throat> who are working on uh, prison reform efforts. Um, and um, yeah, there are lots and lots of them that are pretty active right now. Um, and uh, I could give you some names if you're interested. Um, I don't know, Anne, are you giving them the amend, some of the amend stuff? Yes, I, I have a, a one of their videos, but it's actually on training of guards, but okay. they'll have um, so if you go to site, if, which has a if lot. You, if you go to the, I also uh, asked that there's a group called AMEND uh, at UCSF, University of California, San Francisco hospital system that's run by uh, healthcare professionals that's been working on various, uh, the interaction of healthcare and mass incarceration. They're the ones who are, uh, I saw a quick note in the chat, they're the ones who have a program to bring American correctional officials to Norway and, and uh, take them through the Norwegian system to see a system that's based on a whole different set of principles than our system. And if you go to their website, uh, they actually talk about the Norway uh, system. Some, and, and someone just posted, thank you, their, their website there. You, we incurred, we, they switched quickly to COVID when the crisis broke out. And the uh, plotter receiver, who's appointed by the court, invited them in to uh, look at San Quentin right when the outbreak at San Quentin started in the spring. And they wrote a report about San Quentin that was earth shattering about all the things that were wrong with San Quentin and why they, the San Quentin population needed to be reduced by half quickly or else there'd be a tremendous outbreak there. Um, of course, the system did not follow their guidance and uh, there was a tremendous outbreak. Almost 75% uh, of the incarcerated people at San Quentin uh, became infected with COVID. If you remember in the spring, all of our hospitals around the Bay Area were filled with patients from San Quentin. And uh, the, there were a tremendous number of deaths, but AMEND continues to write reports it is used by us in our advocacy and in other uh, ways in the system. Um, they have, again, just like with us, they, they're advocating for you know, re mass reductions in population, but, but given that the system is either unable or unwilling to do that, and the judges are unable or unwilling to do that, what's next? So we're working on you know, ventilation and masks, and testing, uh, CCR has a much better testing protocol than any of us have. <laughs> they're testing, you know, they're testing everyone once a week. Staff have to be tested uh, once a week. Um, and so they're catching outbreaks much quicker. And when someone has a positive case, you know, they're doing contact tracing, something the rest of our society uh, doesn't do, although the rest of the world does because we don't know how to do it in the United States, being a third world country. Um, and uh, anyway, so 
I got this group together. Amend uh, was there. We had formerly incarcerated people there and different groups of family members of incarcerated. And we just wanted to listen first. You know, this was back in, in uh, late December, early January, when the, when the vaccines were just being talked about and just starting to be available. And um, you may remember there are even more suspicions about the vaccine in society then. You know, what, it's being rushed, is it real? Did they cut corners? But we really wanted just to hear what people were feeling and thinking. And we also wanted them to go back and talk to their loved ones inside and their friends inside and come back to us with feedback. One thing we learned is at first I thought we were gonna give information to CDCR to give out inside. But the first thing we learned is that if the information comes from CDCR, right away, it's not going to be believed. Um, it'd be much better if we can, if we can find messengers that are more credible inside and that the information is delivered by those credible mes messengers. So that's been the effort. It's still ongoing. What we, what we really wanted to do was well, amend came out with a handout, which you can find on the, on their website, very simple but direct handout answering questions and giving information. It's available in multiple languages. And that has been distributed in the prisons by the prison system you know, to everyone and is given out all the time. They've also developed some videos and other messaging, but each of the groups have also worked on their own messaging in their own correspondence and their own telephone calls. And some of them have even made their own videos um, which we've been able to get CDCR to play inside and to do inside. Another thing that was very interesting to me was that, you know, someone said, one of the formerly incarcerated uh, men who was recently released, just a brilliant man, um, he now works at the Ella Baker Center, James King, said, you know, you don't have to, don't make anything special for incarcerated people, they're just people. Just get the information out there, the same information that everyone else is getting. Because if you if you make a special, <laughs> it, it's, it raises suspicions if it's just information for incarcerated people. And that they, they read the newspaper, they watch TV news, they have access to the internet, um, and I and I pushed back. I said, "Well, so many people don't." He said, "I know that so many people don't inside, but the ones who have influence do. So, you know, certain people who are well informed inside are the ones that the other incarcerated people will turn to. You know, and if they step forward and say the vaccine is good, we should take it, uh, then everyone will will take it. So." That's also been our effort to kind of reach the real change makers inside, the critical people, and to help them be informed and to answer their questions. So hopefully they can then be leaders on the inside. Um, so that is still ongoing. Again, there's, well, a lot of vaccines have been distributed. We're now reaching the area where both in society and in the prisons, we're gonna have more resistance, which are the people, you know, 50 and under. Um, people like you guys, um, are you gonna take the vaccine? Um, and, and I bet you won't, as, not all of you, and that's a problem. So again, that's the group inside that, is st that we still need to work on. One of the things that, that I learned was that you know, a bunch of people said to me, well, I, I plan on having children, so I'm not gonna take the vaccine. That sentence makes perfect sense, except there's absolutely no science to it. You know, there's been lots and lots of children born of people who've taken the vaccine. There are lots of people who have become pregnant and uh, there's no science relating the vaccines to any fertility problems, but it is a legitimate, you know, people have that concern, so it's, a very big concern that we keep on hearing from 
younger people. So again, I think listen to people when they talk, but get the get the information so you can answer questions. And if you have your own questions, don't just sit on them and ask ask someone because this is not this is not sort of like just an opt in program. If if we don't do this all as a society, uh, then people are going to continue to die in in high numbers, and we can't reopen. Um, it's not like a I'm like, I can't give a good analogy. It's not like signing up for Netflix or not signing up for Netflix, you know? Uh, it just matters to Netflix. If Unless we all do it, it doesn't work. Um, so there's gonna be a certain number of people that can't do it because of medical problems or other things. But beyond that, we really have to get everyone to do it. And we can, it's not okay. Michael, when we try to move on, there's a couple of questions. Sure. And I'm then sorry. we're gonna take a break and come back for, when we come back after break, um, we're gonna have a video, three videos. And one of them will be about a person that was um, in the AMEND program and was went to Norway and was a, a guard who was, who was trained in their methods. And so you'll get to see that. Um, and we also have a tape about, about Project Rebound and the, the first tape is about Mantama Pius College, which is um, the college that's uh, within San Quentin, a two-year accredited college. Um, so there's two hands. Samaya, do you want to take those? Um, yes, I saw Christina's hand first. So, Hello. Um, also, thank you, Michael Bien, for coming to uh, view this today. Uh, a question I would like to ask you is, what do you think about private pit prisons? Are they better or worse than federal prisons? And do you think private pr prisons will get more of an advantage in getting COVID treatments and vaccines versus federal prisons? So by the way, these prisons I'm talking about are, it's a good question, are state prisons. So just to be complicated, there are, this is the state prison system. You go to state prison if you're convicted in state court, you go to federal prison if you're convicted in federal court. Um, so the cases I've been talking about are in uh, California state prisons. Um, private prisons are problematic. Um, I think that prisons are bad enough without adding a for-profit element to them. Um, but that's a whole long uh, lecture I could give and information. <laughs> um, so I, I can't really tell you much more than you know, just like with other things in capitalism, um, it adds another element that that is troubling. You know, should people be making money off of incarceration? Um, I don't think there's any evidence that uh, private prisons are going to get the vaccines quicker. Or, and by the way, federal prisons are doing pretty poorly on on vaccines so far. Um, they started doing staff and not prisoners. Uh, hopefully now they're actually doing incarcerated people. Um, private prisons, you know, vaccinations are costing uh, CDCR a fortune. While the vaccine itself is free, meaning that it's, you know, they're not, the federal government pays for it and no one has to pay for it. The nurses and, <laughs> and scheduling and all that stuff is not free. So they've had to hire tremendous, tremendous numbers of extra staff to do the vaccinations, keep track of them, do all these things. And um, there's no way private prisons are going to do that. Mm, I see. Thank you. Uh, Michael, we noticed on, on your firm's uh, site, there was an article about coming together to end mass incarceration and, and achieve racial justice. So do you, in your own mind, see us moving in that direction? If so, it's such a, a cultural turning point. How, how might that happen? And um, is there some way we might uh, collectively support a movement that could actually, how do we come together? Is that feasible? And can we really end mass incarceration uh, in our lifetime? Is that something you, you see? And what are some steps to get us in that direction? 
Um, I think that at the beginning of, of the COVID outbreak, we thought that there was an opportunity um, that people would see the people dying in prisons and people working there at, as a turning point. And hopefully this can still be a, a lesson that we can take to you know, push for uh, an end of mass incarceration. Uh, the fact is that uh, prison and jail populations are coming back up to the level they were at before COVID uh, right now. Um, many, many of the jails actually did better than prisons around the country and, and uh, reducing their population. Um, but now a lot of them are, are creeping back up. And um, so, so in the long term, I'm hopeful, um, you know, America still has this tremendously higher incarceration rate than all other uh, Western countries. And there's certainly a long, long way that we could go in reducing incarceration um, and, and not see any uh, effect on crime. In fact, we think it would reduce crime. Um, but uh, what the other side of that coin, Ken, is that here we have California completely controlled by Democrats and unable to do very much on criminal justice reform. Mm -hmm. uh, they've done some things, but very, very minor. Um, none of the COVID reductions are gonna stick because they didn't change any of the sentencing laws. So once right now, for example, there's more than 10,000 people waiting to go to prison in county jails. So that as soon as, as soon as the prison system opens up to reception, uh, it will rapidly you know, fill back up. So, if we don't have the motivation here, you know, um, we need a lot more work on it. So I just think, I think the best thing I can say is, uh, and the reason I'm here today and the reason I accept almost all speaking invitations is that I think more people just need to be informed about what prisons and jails are like um, and, and the, uh, the, uh, as, as one of you pointed out, the racism inherent in the criminal justice system, but also the, the fact that it incarcerates mainly people, people with disabilities, people with serious mental illness. You know, the people who have illnesses get trapped in the system uh, very, very quickly. So one thing is would be a, a new look at substance abuse and go back to policies that we had um, even in the 60s where we didn't criminalize substance abuse. That's something that we invented in the in the 70s. And um, I mean, there were some things, there certainly were people going to prison for, for drugs from time to time, but, it, but it, they weren't like life sentences for drugs. Um, but that's what we have a lot of right now. Um, that's one big area that I think there is a chance to change attitudes and that would reduce the population by a large, large amount. Great. Thank you. Michael, if you have time for one last question, I believe Hunter had a question he wanted to ask. Sure. It's your, you guys do whatever you want. I'm fine. I'm here. <laughs> cool. So I was just wondering, um, cause I don't want to jump the gun here, but it kind of sounds like what you're suggesting is maybe that we're getting closer to more of an institutional failure here. So I was wondering, is there one maybe entity within the government or one, whether it's a bill, one restriction, one individual, or is this a holistic failing? I think uh, we have to start right here in this room because a lot of California's worst laws were passed by us, okay? The voters and people, they see they see something on the ballot. First of all, most people don't vote. That's your first mistake. Second, they don't read anything. 
And third, they, they watch commercials on TV. And, you know, three strikes is a great slogan for baseball, but we passed a, you know, we passed criminal laws based on a slogan. Okay, does that make any sense? You know, so, and, you know, that's, so California, we're very vulnerable to, to mass media. And, you know, we now have two recall elections going against progressive DAs in San Francisco and, and LA. That's a big problem, good thing to work on. And, and the governor, you know, so uh, watch, what, watch what's going on. You know, you gotta get involved in politics and participate and understand and be informed. But I don't think, I think that the failures is really, you know, across all of our systems that the idea that, you know, um, if you read every, everybody keeps on telling me, oh, there's so much crime in San Francisco. Why is that? Because the newspapers keep on saying there's crime in San Francisco. There is no crime in San Francisco. I mean, there's, <laughs> you know, the crime is way, way down. You know, if, if you're talking about violent crime, things people care about. There might be more people breaking into cars, but is that the reason we're gonna, you know, get rid of a DA or increase prison sentences? But that's what we tend to do. We react to news stories and, you know, we say, oh, this bad thing happened. Let's pass a criminal law about it and put people in jail, you know? And so I think that we all need to get informed that, you know, incarcerating people is not a solution to any problems. It harms not only them, but their families and children and uh, destroys communities. And, you know, it's a, it's a really, really um, dangerous thing that we've gotten into. Um, and, and we, you know, and we all have to watch ourselves, you know, because how do you feel about uh, you know, those horrible sex offenders. Well, you know, well, they're different. They're okay to punish for life and not let out. Well, it's this, you, you can't rate, you have to believe in what you're saying, okay? You, you can't criminal, you know, think that criminal law, because someone else is gonna think that, you know, um, a different kind of crime is the worst one. You know, it, you have to really believe that the criminal justice system has to be completely revamped and get back to a system that is designed to, uh, from day one, get people better so they can return to their communities and families. That should be the purpose, you know. And um, again, I urge you to, there's lots of things online about Norway uh, there's lots of videos, there's a 60 Minutes, there's a, a things on Netflix. It's, a, it's very interesting to watch a whole different system. And, and um, they have the, ex and then you, you talk to people and they say, oh, those are different people, different human beings in Norway. And what they mean is they're white. <laughs> and guess what? They're not white. <laughs> they, they, have a, they also have a mixed, you know, they're also a diverse population. And human beings are human beings. There's no difference between anyone. This, you know, we, we all look a little bit different, but people are people, and they all commit the same crimes. And if you read the Bible, the same crimes are committed then too. You know, we've always done bad things to each other. The question is how we react to them. So, I just think that what's wonderful about the Nor these this focus on Norway, and it's not the only system that's like that. There, there are lots of them. Is there are other ways? You know, there are other methods and they actually work. Okay, the, the first video is, um, you can see Michael there, um, is, uh, shows you a graduation from the Prison University Project, which is now called Mount Tamalpais College. It's a two-year accredited college, um, California accredited college that um, is housed and takes place in, um, San Quentin, it used to be until they got their own accreditation about a year ago, <clears throat> it was done through Patton, Patton College, which is a accredited college in California, but now they have their very own. So we can start this one. On behalf of the Prison University Project, 
I welcome you to the 2018 Patton University at San Quentin graduation. Yeah. What makes a prison university project graduation unique are the graduates themselves. There was a time in each of these men's lives when graduating from college seemed like a ridiculous goal. By any standard you can think of, the men we are honoring today are exceptional. And this group of men right here in this front row, I respect your hustle. And your hustle is not over. You've got to connect with the right folks that will help you continue on and do exactly the same thing outside of these walls. This is your day. This is your time. But understand it's not over. And you got family that will help you do just what you want to do in that continuance. The salutatorian for the class of 2018 is well known. He is respected and liked by many. For me, he is a friend and colleague, Jose Rivera. I welcome you to join us as we recognize something that was built with sweat, tears, surprises, sleepless nights, frustration, determination, and a stubborn refusal to let this opportunity pass us by. My fellow graduates, I have three words for you. We did it. This is something that we can all be proud of, and our knowledge can never be taken away from us. It can only be added to. Let this be just the first step in a lifetime of learning. We should continue to learn through words, books, and instruction. Without the help, concern, and encouragement of PUP staff, this wouldn't be possible. They actually care, they're impossibly patient, and they encourage you every step of the way. If we can do this here, we can do anything, anywhere. The race for education is not always a sprint. Sometimes it's a grueling marathon, and that makes the victory twice as sweet. What we have created here, all of us together, a completely free, high-quality liberal arts college that happens to be located in a prison is, is rare in the world, right? And I think that the dedication that you show and the ways in which you inspire your teachers and your community is extraordinary. And I just hope you always, always remember that, that you are, you are a movement, you're a, you're a beacon of sanity and, and rationality and creativity and love in the world. And we honor you, not just in prison, but in the universe itself. So thank you for everything you do. Graduates, you may now move your tassel from right to left. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in celebrating the 2018 graduating class at University. The um, woman that you heard speak um, is uh, one of the founding people and primary shepherd of the um, Prison University Project, now Mount Tamil Pius College. Her name is Jody um, Lewin. And uh, if you go, there's great viewing if you go to Mount Tam Colleges and look at their videos. Um, when you're feeling like you want to quit school, you can pop in one of those <laughs> and it'll make you want to stay. Um, uh, the next video that we're going to see is um, about Project Rebound, which is at your very own college. Um, and it has some nice pictures of your campus in case you can't remember what it looks like. Um, and the person who started this, his, his name is John Irwin. Um, who died a while ago, but um, he got his vision, I read, for this project when he was in a uh, Soledad prison. Um, and he realized that, that the, a lot of the um, incarcerated people there didn't know how to read. And so it sort of started with him teaching people to read and then it's become this uh, very broad program. Um, so enjoy. It was like being locked up. This, like, only thing I can reference it with is a, a caged animal. Um, 
you know, when people have uh, Rottweilers and pit bulls and they cage them up in kennels and just let them out for that little hour to go run around and you know, cage them back up and throw food in there. That's what being locked up is like. To be in that situation and to think about getting an education, it seems unrealistic. When I got here, I wasn't gonna identify with nobody. Nobody could feel my pain. Nobody didn't want to say pads with me. Nobody walked in my shoes. So that's not true at all. It's not true at all. They have programs, not programs. They have a program, Project Me Down, that is here that will help you. It was that same type of safety net that I had somebody. If I was hungry, I could come to and get a, a, a little card. They have these little value cards that you can take to a couple of the uh, vendors here, get something to eat. They got bark tickets to help you get here. So I didn't, I had no excuses. Then I ran out of excuses. Like then it became about what I need to get, what, what I need to do. Two degrees down, so I'm headed that way. For all the brothers and sisters out there who afraid to go to college because y'all think that there's nobody out there that can feel your pain, you're wrong. It's, it's a lot of brothers and sisters here that can definitely identify with you. Project Rebound means to me, uh, um, it means a lot to me because it's a support system for me. I, I, I was a convicted felon and I lost my job making $19 an hour. But when I lost that job, okay, I was already in, I was already networking with Project Rebound. So it enabled me to go to school full time and have the support that I needed in order to get to where I am right now. College was easier for me to become a part of and to strive in that system because of the structure and the fact that there were other people that could relate to the, the, the prison experience. But when you get to campus, it, it was wonderful to, to, to get a chance to be met and to greet uh, uh, by Project Rebound. And uh, of course, I was on campus when I first uh, uh, you know, got an opportunity to meet the folks at Project Rebound, but I'd heard about them for years. So when I got a chance to meet them, it was very influential in, in my growth because there were people that were there to help me uh, adjust to the system and, and to uh, support me and, and encourage me uh, as to let me know that I can do this. Most of my motivation comes to do this work and to work with especially formerly incarcerated or currently incarcerated students through Project Rebound and other programs is really my understanding of the, the value of higher education for all students. What I notice about the, the formerly incarcerated students or currently incarcerated students that I work with is their immense intrinsic motivation to make this happen. And I think that is the part that I really enjoy about these students is, is the, the understanding that there's a lot of stake and I really want this no matter what the obstacles are. And I feel like San Francisco State Project Rebound and higher education is a tool to help them to socially reintegrate, to become public people, become citizens and stakeholders in our community. Um, the third one is you people have mentioned the Norway project, um, uh, the Norway system, and you had stuff about that in your <clears throat> preparation materials for this evening. Um, this clip is of uh, a prison guard um, from the prison in Bismarck, North Dakota, um, <clears throat> who's been through the, the training, the Norway-based training uh, in cahoots with Amend. Um, and it's a conversation between the guard and um, the prisoners that he works with. I feel comfortable with you and I have respect for you because I know 
that you look at me as another human and not just an inmate, you know. I remember a lot of the beginning of it that we didn't get along real well because yeah. when there was problems going on, I was the guy that would show up yeah. to either tell you what you had to do or take you to the hole. Yeah. I think what Amanda's doing is going to change the world. I do. I'm a physician and I come into these environments and there is extraordinary human suffering. And it's the residents and it's also the staff. I went in search of another system that had a public health approach to corrections. I found that in Norway. In Norway, I found a system where people go to court to get punished. They go to prison to become better neighbors. When I went to Norway, I saw every person, every inmate or resident is treated as a single person instead of a group. Amend is offering prison systems the skills and the tools that their staff needs to transform themselves into a place that puts health and well-being for both staff and residents at the forefront of all that they do. With AMEND, I feel like they are helping our department to really create that humanization, to really create an environment that is more normal, less institutionalized. It was pretty emotional because at some point you think, how much harm have I been causing by not doing things differently? This is about public safety at its greatest, long-term public safety, where you're helping people gain a sense of self and self-worth and see the value. And you can't do that in a system that's harmful as opposed to restorative. Now, I will talk to any of the residents on a daily basis and a lot of them all the time where I may have been more reserved before. It's a lot nicer being able to come and talk with you rather than tell you what you have to do. You do see the changes. Like today, I was having one of those days, you know, there's like something's gonna happen, you know, and I'm battling myself, literally battling myself mentally. Uh, you know, what's the better option? Am I gonna sit here and get in trouble or should I talk to Lukesh? And instead of having that aggressive CEO to add fuel to the fire, having somebody that's going to be like, okay, we'll think about this. Let's go through this skill and actually work with the guy to calm a guy down and, and get a guy thinking clearly. One of the largest impacts that I've seen is the relational change between our security staff and the adults in our custody. When you start treating individuals as human beings, they respond in the same way. They start seeing our staff as people that are human beings themselves. I see the mentality or the change that they have given or with the level of respect and the, the um, being human in nature, you could see that it's starting to turn, just in my view, you know? And I'm just trying to figure out on how we can become a better uh, community as in prison. And, and I'm just wondering on how we can show the community or give back to the community and show that we're, we're different. The changes. Stop now. changes are happening and it's for us. It's just people actually showing that they care. So it's really eliminating the us versus them mentality, which is creating just overall wellness, both for our clients and our staff. I don't want to be somebody different than who I am just because I came to work. I don't want to put on a different face because I came to work. I, you and I aren't different, we're people. You're headed out one day and that's the, we gotta keep working towards that. And, yeah, working together as people, it's a good yeah. thing that way. If we go backwards, I don't know that I can stay in corrections. This is what we need to do. We, we, can, we can stop. Mm, so, so that's the end of those short videos, but there's I sort of was binge watching um, prison related videos over the last couple of weeks. And um, there's a lot out there that's so informing. And um, 
so moving and so horrifying um, and so hopeful. And um, if anybody's interested in some of the links that I went to, um, shoot me um, an email. You all have my email. Um, and I'll try and put together a bibliography if there's enough, or a videography, um, if there's enough interest. Um, and Ken could put it into the iLearn spot. So just let me know. Um, Michael, did you want to make any remarks? You're muted. I'm glad you um, picked those. And I think they, um, for all of us program, there are programs like, like uh, Mount Tam College and Project Rebound. And I think they show that there are things we can do. I think sometimes we're also overwhelmed. What can we do about mass incarceration? What can we do about reentry? What can we do? And if you try to, fix the whole thing all at once, um, you'll just throw up your hands and, and give up. I think that these are examples of the fact that there, there are people who are already doing good things that they work, um, they need to be scaled up, we need, to, we need to invest more in them, but it just shows that if you connect people with people that you can, you know, change the world. And, and uh, these, these are examples uh, of those. And I don't think there's anything different about the people who were in Project Rebound or in Mount Tam College than all the rest of the people who are in prison right now. They just haven't had the chance. There's just very few programs and opportunities. Um, that's something we can expand on, you know, access to education, and anyone who asks you about it, it's fully evidence-based, meaning that it's been tested and you know, every penny you spend on it you know, delivers tremendously in terms of money and save lives and reduce crime. So you know, that's one simple answer um, to, to this tough question. And you did a great job just showing it. And yeah, thanks. Um, one of the... In the Project Rebound video, um, they have the, an, one on the ASI site that's about 10 minutes long that's also really, really good. Um, and one of the people who used to be an intern has been working at Project Rebound. I, I'm not sure whether or not he's still there, but he's in the photos. Um, and he was a remarkable, is I'm still sure, a remarkable person. and. Um, uh, he, he, he talked about, you know, what it's like to know nothing when you come out and, and have nobody um, and how these programs were essential to his success on the outside. Um, he talked about that in the internship. And so take a look at the Project Rebound um, on the ASI website or the SFSU website under ASI. Ken, do you want to finish us up for the evening? Well, just uh, one final question as well as we'll move to close if there's no one else. Um, we actually have till 645 if we want to go that long. Um, oh, I forget that. <laughs> uh, it's all good, it's all good. Um, this is such a challenging topic and, and many of us get triggered by different aspects of where to start. Uh, but I'm just curious, so, We've heard of uh, various positive movements like the restorative justice movement. Um, are there are the various movements you'd really recommend for uh, you know young people to get involved with that, that really might be leverage points? Uh, the complexity is obvious, the racialization, the, the the gender class bias, all that's obvious. But how do we how do we really provide some vision, some hope for change versus as you say, throw our hands up in the air. This, it, it seems uh, huge. Our whole culture as well is just, uh, so any starting points or, or movements you'd recommend for young people to begin to look at more deeply? Well, I think that, um, first of all, doing what you're doing right here, you already started, you're learning. And that's really important to be educated about it, to read about it, 
to to understand and uh, there's a tremendous literature now developing about uh, mass incarceration um, and uh, the new Jim Crow, I think, is the most significant book that I've read on the subject in the last decade. Um, and, you know, it's it just connects very clearly, you know, slavery and Jim Crow and mass incarceration and the death penalty. Um, and I think that's an important uh, narrative to understand. Um, I, I think I really recommend opportunities where you can actually meet a human being who's been affected by the system. And by the way, you know, there's several million people who are incarcerated, but there are another five, six million people who are on probation or parole. Again, uh, tremendously greater impact in communities of color and um, there are lots and lots of ways of volunteering or helping. It could be in a, in a halfway house and a drug treatment program, substance abuse. It could be in Project Rebound. There are lots of places doing re-entry. They're actually picking up people at the gate, you know, people coming out, out and they, they give them uh, a backpack with some clothes and a cell phone and a, take them for a meal and help them get to their first location. Um, I think it's just, it, you know, talk to human beings is, is good. There's also groups that work with families of incarcerated uh, people. Um, there's uh, children of, of incarcerated people. There's, there's lots and lots of opportunities. Um, and uh, so I, and again, if you're interested in advocacy and pushing for better uh, criminal justice reform and legislation, there are lots of groups working on that. Um, uh, the Ella Baker Center is, is near here. The uh, Project Rebound, uh, I mentioned, uh, I'm sorry, I was also gonna say uh, a group called Root and Rebound, R-O-O-T and Rebound specializes in re-entry issues. Um, there's a lot of restorative justice programs uh, in the Bay Area. Some of them, when San Quentin opens up again, does do things in San Quentin. Uh, you can be trained as, you know, as a counselor to work with, with restorative justice groups, both inside and outside. Um, there's lots of juvenile justice programs. Um, you know, I think this, this is a, you know, between Berkeley, Oakland and San Francisco, there's a plethora of groups to, to join and be involved in. Um, if you're, if you're interested in the current, very current, uh, active activities, there's a group called Stop, uh, work that, that protests outside of San Quentin. Uh, regularly about COVID issues, um, and there are groups, lots of groups working on legislation right now, you know, prison reform litigation, police reform litigation. And, and I think that, um, again, I think like the campaign, um, I don't know how, I never wanted to sign up for this, but suddenly I started getting messages from next door. You know what that is, this neighborhood thing. Um, and people in my community, which is, I live near San Francisco State, and they want to get rid of our progressive DA, you know, so I, I stuck my nose in and said, why, <laughs> you know, he's, he's doing a good job, you know, and, oh, you, know um, you know, he's the cause of all the, I mean, these things matter, whose DA matters, whose mayor matters, whose governor matters, and then, but then once you have them in there, you got to push them to do do things. So, you know, get informed and participate. Um, that's, that's the best I can say, Ken. <laughs> Any final questions or thoughts uh, to air before we draw close to this? 
I, I want to thank Michael for um, taking the time to be with us. I know he's he's extremely busy, mm -hmm. um, but I think it shows his heart uh, and how he really wants more and more people to study and understand what's going on in the prisons um, and to figure out a way that they can help, whatever the way is. Um, there's a lot of opportunities and you just have to search for one that works for you. And if you have time, be able to plug that into your, into your day. And when San Francisco State campus reopens, whatever that might be, to walk down the hall from Holistic Health. Um, and I think that's where they still are, where Project Rebound is. Um, and that might be a really wonderful way to uh, dip your dip your toe in um, in, a, in ways to help people. Um, so thank you, Michael. Bless my, ple you. my pleasure for being here. Thank you all. And just a thought maybe for all of us, because uh, it, we get called to jury duty every so often, right? And uh, typically you think that uh, race and class and gender matter just in prison, they matter also in jury selection. So uh, just being active and participating with your values, because after all, you're here gathering and deepening them in your classes. So um, let's see if we can look at the, uh, somehow the, the system needs great repair. And maybe with COVID here, uh, we could use this moment to really deepen reflection and, and pass it on in some way that might also be deeper and create a ripple that could make it possible for the next generation to really view this as likely. Yeah. And protecting the rights um, for people to vote, especially people of color. You're here. Well, thanks everyone. Uh, stay on too. We'll just call it. We're, calling this a close for the sake of the film. So uh, thank you for coming and uh, thank you for participating tonight, everyone. Mm -hmm.